Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our stats club. Um, the uh, the directors cut. Directors our stats club cut. Um, today I'm going to be talking. I'm going to be picking up on where I left off two months ago on the second half of um, chapter two of the uh, modern statistics from modern biologists textbook um it, it there's a lot of examples we're going to be touching on uh, markov chains and we're going to be talking about bayesian thinking as the book puts it so um we have mostly we have like a few examples um and um this is a sort of thing where <clears throat> Presentation might be a little bit of a collaborative effort. So, um, you know, I appreciate everyone for um, showing up today and let's get started. Um, I'm gonna start sh sharing. Okay, can you guys see everything? What's going on? All right, so um, I'm starting off, I'm picking up like pretty much exactly where I left off. Um, on uh, chapter two, 2.73, sorry, 2.7.3, concatenating multiple multinomials, sequence motifs, and logos. So diving right into it, we, this book, kind of like, let's see. Oh, yes. So picking up where we left off, we were talking about the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Um, pretty in-depth about that. Let me see what the broader, oh, we're talking about how um, like variables are not always totally dependent or sorry, independent, like um, whether or not you have uh, this form of color blindness may also depend on your sex. So um, yes, uh, broader, so two categorical variables. I want to Go zoom out a little bit. Okay, this is part of 2.7 Char, -ga Char Gaff's rule, where he talks about he like weighed was able to like weigh figure out nucleotide frequencies um, by weighing them, but he didn't get the raw weights. He just published the percentages of the mass present in organisms of each different nucleotide. Um, so. Uh, what was his rule? Long before using weight of the molecules, he asked whether nucleotides occurred at equal frequencies. I guess his um, rule is that they don't, uh, which we now know and very well. Um, so anyway, that was this is the little section that this this part is nestled in, and we talk about um, oh Josh is raising his hand. I can't see any of any of you by the way. Okay. So, I, uh, I think the big thing with, with Chagra's rule, if I remember, is okay, that- so I completely uh, butchered the pronunciation. <laughs> I know. I don't know how to say it either. But uh, they, they didn't know that like nucleotides necessarily were pairing like that. So the oh, they didn't that, know like, about like ATCG or mm -hmm. whatever. And so that was kind of the first indication. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Um, yeah, so I guess I guess it's that and that he was figuring out. I guess I don't still don't really know exactly what his rule is, other than that maybe nucleotides don't occur at equal frequencies. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's good to know. That's good to know that he uh, he was like operating in the context of not even knowing how the nucleotides pair off. Thank you, Josh. Um, so we're gonna start right into uh, dive right in. We're talking about position weight uh, matrices. So we're trying to find out the Kozak motif, which is a sequence that occurs close to a start codon. Um, the start codon has a fixed spelling, but five possession, five positions to the left of it, there's a nucleotide pattern um, where the letters are not all equally likely. Anyway. Um, we all are probably familiar with like a weights matrix, kind of like 
informing the probability of um, each of any given nucleotide, maybe um, transcript, you know, if we were to like think of it more abstractly, like, you know, that's like the kind of thing I work with is are like weights that correspond to the frequency of like a particular transcript at a certain position. Um, but here we <clears throat> approach it to generate one of these. I'm sure we've all seen these in various papers. They honestly look a little silly to me, but this is a sequence logo. Um, and uh, here we make the point that um, they are rarely, the multiple categorical variables are rarely independent. Um, uh, and we make the smooth transition, as you would imagine, to talking about chains, sequences, how preceding elements in a sequence can inform a prediction about what can come next. You guys are probably thinking we're talking about Markov chains, and you'd be correct. Uh, so a Markov chain is like the example the book gives, which I thought was pretty good, was um, just basically predicting tomorrow's weather based on the today's weather and that you ne wouldn't necessarily even need to look that far in the past to make an accurate pred prediction about tomorrow's weather or makes any sort of like future prediction because the all of the data about previous weather is encoded in today's weather. But um, it is not always the case that K equals one. Um, K can be more than one, but hopefully not too much of a large number. K being the number of days. In this example, you look in the past, but it could just more generally speaking, be in a sequence, the number of elements in the sequence that you look behind. You, you, you evaluate the previous elements. Um, so taking this into the realm of sequences, biological sequences, um, you know, we say we might see specific succession of patterns so that the pairs of nucleotides called diagrams, which I've never heard this, I've never heard this term before, um, like CG, CA, CC, and CT, not equally frequent. And so the probability of C and A uh, is not equal to the probability of C occurring independently followed by A occurring independently. Does that, does that make sense? Is everyone following me so far? Cool. So um, we, can just, we can just make this like funky looking flow chart thing, a, a DAG. This, or this is not a DAG actually, this is undirected. This goes in every particular direction and kind of shows you the weights of each nucleotide following another nucleotide um, as a schematic representation of such transitions. We're talking about nucleotide transitions. Um, and so now let's talk about, I guess from here we're going into th thinking about taking data into consideration, um, like some sort of prior knowledge into consideration. Um, we're going to venture into the realm of um, Bayesian thinking. And this is the area, this is when I started, this is when I started having a little bit of a tough time like seeing the bigger picture. So uh, maybe we can work through that together or maybe it'll make sense to me more trying to uh, explain it to um, you all. So, uh, um, so far, what we've been doing is that we've been um, taking like these fixed walking into um, walking into making some sort of like uh, we've been working with like fixed parameters, right? So um, we we know them; they're definite; they're fixed numbers. Um, but it doesn't. This does not. This does not like give us um, a greater level of real world flexibility, I guess, like 
like it does not using like a fixed parameter it's kind of like making from what i understand it's kind of like making an assumption that um, does not correspond necessarily to what we may all actually already know um, and so in the bayesian paradigm you can actually use prior knowledge to um, enter like a distribution as a parameter. Um, so let me just read this verbatim. The Bayesian paradigm is a practical approach where prior and posterior distributions are used as models of our knowledge before and after collecting some data and making an observation. It is particularly useful for integrating or combining information from different sources. Okay, so uh, yeah, like using prior knowledge to inform a statistical analysis and then later using the data you generated to refine your analysis. Does that, does that make sense? I mean, if anyone else knows more about this topic, does what I say, did what I say make sense? Does, do I seem to have like a good general understanding of this? We're good. I think we're good. I would think we're good. How's everyone doing? Are we, are we following along? Are we doing okay? How's the, how's my podcast? You guys like my podcast? Okay. So um, like, let's say we have an hypothesis H. Uh, we can, we can formalize our prior knowledge about H as a prior probability like P of H, the prior probability. And then, and then once we, after we see the data given a prior probability, we can see we have a formula P of H given D. Um, so we're going to start with an example. Um, you guys know what a haplotype is. It is a collection of alleles um, uh, that are spatially adjacent on a chromosome, usually inherited together and thus genetically linked. Um, so here's an image of an elite, or sorry, a haplotype. And in this particular example, we're looking at um, short tandem repeats. Um, so uh, in this example, let's see, hold on. In this example, we want to estimate the proportion of a particular Y haplotype um, that consists of a set of different short tandem repeats. So um, here we are, here's the table and these are the different haplotypes. And so, um, yeah, you can see for each one of these different haplotypes in the sample data, um, like it shows you the number of STRs at each position. Uh, et cetera. And we need to find the underlying proportion, which we'll be referring, referring to as theta of the haplotype of interest in the population of interest, excuse me. Um, so using the um, Bayesian state of mind, um, we can, uh, instead of assuming our parameter theta is a singular value, we can kind of see it more as like a broad as like a spectrum of different or a range of different values um, uh, that all might, that all have like uh, varying degrees of, of like the validity in use of, in the use of our um, statistical analysis. And it, um, it, it, it's just an expression of what we think theta might be. Uh, so here's a bunch of math. I didn't really like uh, dig into, although uh, I did, this, this was important um, because we're looking at probabilities and probabilities tend to be um, values between zero and one, we use the beta distribution. And the beta distribution is a family of different, um, a uh, family of different distributions that are between zero and one, basically. There's a variety of different beta distributions and they have, uh, an alpha and a beta parameter. Um, yes, fit into a lot of different situations. This is what 
these are different these are different um, beta distributions right here that kind of show you um, what's going on with that. So, um, so if we have a singular uh, theta value, we know what the distribution of y is by vir virtue of this equation right here. Um, we can get we can get y somehow. Um, uh, but what is the distribution of y if theta is also a distribution? That's what we call the marginal distribution of y. So we're going to get our hands dirty right now. And I have a lot of questions about this stuff, but here, I'm going to comment this out. Um, so here, we generate our, I guess this is our prior distribution. This is, these are our um, thetas. So our theta is we have um, we have you know ten thousand or how oh that's a hundred thousand. We have a hundred thousand um, probabilities, simulated probabilities um, according to the beta distribution, and these are the parameters we used fifty for alpha and three fifty for beta. Um, and then we use v apply to take each element in theta and um, find a um, binomial. What would this be like? Um, random binomial tests, I guess. The probability defined by each element in this vector are theta, three hundred for each element. So this is. 300 times 100,000, I think. That's how many tests we're doing, okay? And then we plot it here on a histogram. And so what we're looking at is how many times each weight got, how many times Y, each weight X, um, each weight got X, numbers, X number of successes. Does that make sense? So are you guys following me here? We're good? Okay. Uh, actually, could you back up a little? I feel like- Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So is it not just uh, like, my understanding was is a distribution you're creating, um, but maybe I missed something like- um... Yeah, so- um, yeah, I mean that's that's pretty much that's pretty much it. Um, like we're I'm creating this distribution of thetas, right? Like okay. I'm randomly generating r theta, a bunch of thetas, a hundred thousand of them, and then I'm, I guess I'm finding the binomial distribution by using the thetas as probabilities, and then for each probability, each element in this. Oh. vector i'm doing 300 tests and then i'm taking the number of successes okay okay for each one and so that's what we're looking at here is the number of times we see the number that like any particular number of successes so we're using a distribution of probabilities to create a distribution of values that's that's what happened yes okay. <laughs> yes um I don't know, KJ. Do you do you have do you have experience? Um, do you think you would be able to elaborate a little bit on on this? Oh, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah I guess. Yeah. Have you been talking this whole time? No. Oh, okay. Uh, you explained it pretty well. Uh, you what? normally don't really think about the math behind this kind of thing but what they did was they used the beta distribution so that they could create a zero to one sum and then from that they made another distribution that you can then calculate p-values from so you can get a beta statistic from this and then compare your value to this distribution so that theoretically should be the next step so like if you're up here by like 60 or on the other hand, around 20, you're probably getting a significant difference in the position. But that's mm -hmm. like the next step. 
Mm -hmm. Wait, okay, so the orange graph, is it p-values or is it? No, it's like, it's what you would consider the beta statistic. When okay. You want to get it. So this is where you would compare your table with to get a p-value. Oh, okay, okay. That's, that's oh. Really, you know, uh, classic, uh, that, the first statistic class you took, this is what they're going for. So you're creating your normal, like normally we use the normal distribution to exact out, but here they're creating a different distribution based off of the data because theoretically you can't have anything less than zero. So, mm -hmm. so this is this is like sort of like a reference because everything here is like these are all like simulated values. So this is kind of like a reference for my next analysis. Yeah, it's, you're giving you an idea of thinking about how it works, but yes, it's pretty much just a reference. Okay. Cool. Um, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I feel like I, so what, what happens next is that we um, compute the posterior distribution of theta by conditioning those outcomes where y was 40. And I feel like I had a hard time understanding why we picked 40 in particular, because I was wondering like, okay, is 40 the mode number of successes or like 40 the mode for the um, this Y distribution, you know, like Y 40 in particular. And so I like, I, I didn't know what I was even asking or how to go about asking why it was 40. So I found this function called get mode. And then I made this into like a while loop to like, see how many times I would have to run this to get a um, mode of y equals 40. And it just pretty squarely was like 37 each time. And so I, I don't know why this they said we are going to keep all the probabilities whose simulated binomial success rates were 40. Um, so and they did they, they don't like really explicitly say that anywhere here so i don't know i mean would you have any idea why they picked 40 here oh we can't hear you i'm looking back to see if they're if that's a question because you normally pick y based off of your your, your hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going back in the text to see if there's an answer. Oh, okay. Working plus. Hmm. Huh. Yeah, I mean, maybe it has something to do with like the sun, like, I don't know. I can't think what it would I'm just like taking they a shot in the dark. Y equals 40, the whole chapter. So maybe they're just continuing on that. Oh, really? The like 2.4, they also use Y is equal to 40. Oh, that's not going to work. Section 2.4. Oh, not figure 2.4. This lambda area. Where is the? F I wonder what the first instance of them sitting. Right there. Success is equals y equals forty. Observe y equals forty. Where? Oh, right here. Suppose. Oh, okay. Suppose n equals three hundred and y equals forty. Wow. Okay. All right. So I guess they're just sticking to y equals forty based off that. Okay, well, we, we can we can move, move, we can move along and then um, maybe I can look into this and follow up on the R stats club um, channel. But yeah, I, I, I guess I guess that makes I, mean, I guess that makes good sense. Anyway, um, what we did do was uh, upon conditioning, upon conditioning, we um, we end up with 
theta posterior, I guess, emp is empirical, where we empirically, where we got empirically as opposed to our theoretical values. Um, and so let me generate this graph. Um, another question I had was why for the beta distribution, like where do these parameters 90 and 610 come from? And I think they kind of answer it a little bit later on um, because it says our, its parameters 90, alpha equals 90 and beta equals 610 were obtained by summing the prior parameters, alpha equals 50 and beta equals 350 with observed successes, y equals 40 and observed failures. Um, n minus y equals 260. And then, um, so they do explain it eventually. I guess it doesn't fully click for me, but um, that's okay. So anyway, this is our post posterior um, distribution. This is what, this is what we come up with after we take all of the um, indices where y of y, where y equals 40, and use that to get the probabilities um, that correspond to y uh, equals 40. And then we use that to create a histogram. Uh, oh, and then our, our posterior, our theoretical posterior distribution is um, d beta which density, that's density beta distribute, the, the D stands for density. Um, and we just generate a beta distribution using our parameters and this like sequence of 0 0.001 intervals. Um, and so now we can, we compare our posterior distribution to um, our, theoretical posterior distribution and um, the means, we compare those means and the means are pretty dang close. Hmm. So this is, this is all simulated. So I guess, um, I guess what we're, I'm, I'm trying to, I guess what is hard for me to zoom out, how I said it, it's what I don't get the big picture of is um, like really what we demonstrated or what we learned by comparing the like empirical, empirical um, posterior distribution um, with the theoretical posterior distribution. Like did we, I guess we learned that our Y's are, or like we, we learned that, yes, we are indeed using a beta distribution as our prior distribution, or maybe we were refining something. Um, I don't know if anyone has any light to shed on that. All right, well, if I figure out, I'll let you guys know. I will post about it. Um, but anyway, we go ahead and um, so we go ahead and we do a Monte Carlo integration. We, we kind of, which from my understanding is we just kind of like create a beta distribution with n equals a million or what, whatever. I guess this is a million. And we see what happens. And we get pretty much the same thing. Um, and uh, we probably cover this last chapter, but like from my understanding, is my understanding, like, Monte Carlo simply means like just bootstrapping data or like just assuming assuming like a certain like um, baseline level of ignorance when contri like basically contriving data to perform a statistical analysis. Um, 
for here, uh, they're using it to for simplicity. Because mm -hmm. ideally, what you want to do is take the integral of your two uh, curves and mm -hmm. compare those. But that gets computationally intensive because that's an exact. So what they're doing is approximation with the Monte Carlo integration instead. Mm -hmm. so they are using bootstrapping to sub to do like a sample. So the difference between using the population versus a sample is what they're doing here. So mm -hmm. they're doing an approximation of of this integral instead of the actual integration. Mm. So that's what that's what we just did with the um, this like Bayesian analysis is that we although we did use simulated values we treated those simulated values as though they were like real data. And um, we did like a very, we did like an exact integration. Yeah, this, like if you scroll down here, you see this uh, delta theta and then they take the sum of the density. You, that's like taking the integral right there because you're that's doing the, the, the delta times the actual theta times the, the density function for the theta, and that's the integration over it from zero to one. I see. Uh, and so you don't want to do that for everything, which is what they're doing now is they're moving on to Monte Carlo because it's a small subset. Mm -hmm. That's why they're doing it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how long that took them, but ideally you don't want to do, it's not possible to do. It's not possible to do the, like the full integration every time. It's, yeah, especially if we're considering like uh, um, SNPs, uh, haplotypes, because mm -hmm. you can get millions. If you're only looking at like a, a thousand, I think doing this is fine mm -hmm. over a small population. But if you're also doing like a hundred thousand people, then still you, you probably want to do an approximation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. Cool. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess I'm still having trouble like understanding the big picture here. Like, I guess this, I'm at the risk of sounding very dumb. I still don't really fully understand like what, what, the, oh, I guess we're like figuring out like haplotype frequencies right now but like um i don't know like i it's hard for me to like fully wrap my mind around what it is we are getting by performing by doing this like what the result is like are we are we are we are, are is is y equals 40 i guess the like some sort of arbitrary like haplotype, like the frequency of some haplotype we are um, like in looking for in this example, I guess nobody would know. And the only person who should know is me, but I don't know. <laughs> and if Leo was here, he would be able to answer, but he's not. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that for another time. We'll leave that for another discussion. Um, so anyway, we, we compute our, uh, Monte Carlo posterior um, distribution with our, uh, yeah, it's basically the same. And here we compare it using a QQ plot and it's pretty close, it's pretty similar. So we have this like short hand, like this easier way of doing the integration, the Monte, Monte Carlo style and um, uh, so, um, the posterior distribution is also a beta distribution. Uh, we already, uh, covered this. We're moving on to another, like another shorter example, maybe conceptual. Um, let's say we have a new set of data with N equals 150 observations and Y equals 25 successes, thus 125 failures. Um, what would theta be? And, um, we calculate the parameters of the beta distribution um, using the same logic as before. 
So 90 plus 25, 610, these are the values we generated in the, um, with the last data set. Um, and the mean of the distribution would be 0.135. So one estimate of theta would be 0.135. So here, this is the maximum a postor, posteriori estimate, um, which is, I guess, like the, our maxed idea or the max. Um, hmm, I guess I kind of like skipped this part, but this is something else. And we check it numerically. And we can see that the maximum. I think I think I might have like checked out just for this one section alone. So we can skip ahead. Um, the prior the prior rarely changes the posterior distribution substantially unless it is a very peaked distribution. Um, and I guess we would already know before going into it if it was going to be very peaked. Um, and the best situation is to have enough data to swamp the prior so that its choice doesn't have much impact on the final result. So more data, I guess, the prevailing theme of um, all of this is more data. And here we use, uh, here we come up with confidence intervals. So uh, we only have a little bit more time. I don't want to. I don't want to spend a lot of time, um, especially if like, how how are we all doing? Are we good? Are you guys? Are you guys? Are you guys liking this? We're getting a smile from Luis. That's good. I'm getting a thumbs up from Nick. Cool. Okay. Um, let's go. Uh, let's go into um, using another example: occurrence of a nucleotide pattern in a genome. Um, so now we're looking at a distribution of distances, which are quasi continuous. Um, and so this is between the instance of the sigma to even, you know, sequence. Okay. So anyway, we load bio strings, whatever. And this is what we're working with. This stuff is what we're working with. Um, let's look at the available genomes. We very casually have 102 available genomes on deck. And we're gonna use, I guess we're gonna use the E. coli one right now. So we're looking for um, <clears throat> this particular motif, AGG, AGGT. Um, and so we're gonna use the genome sequence of E. coli to do this. Um, and we define a window with a width of 50K. And um, we use the count we we use this pa the this function in the package count pattern, um, which we'll see in a second. So these are the number of matches that we got. These are the number of instances of match with this particular the Shine Dalgarno, which is a really cool name. I love that Shine Dalgarno. Um, <laughs> I would love it if the, I was like a detective and that was my name. Anyway, um, so these are the number of times we got uh, a match with the Shine Delgarno motif. And um, we want to ask what distribution might this fit? Well, we have the answer. Poisson is a good candidate. And um, let's see. Okay. I did not look at this before, but. Um, Anyway, we can we can view the number. We can view all the instances of um, matching sequences using match pattern, um, and then we can look at the sequences between these matches using between motifs. So we have we have all of this. We have sixty six gaps and sixty five matches, um, and. If the motifs occur at random locations, we expect the gap length to follow an exponential distribution. This means that most, because the gaps are happening randomly, most of the gaps will be roughly an equal number of um, 
nucleotides apart, and then we will have outliers. Um, so if we have this like we have this like I guess log scale graph that shows that indeed um, we do roughly fit an exponential distribution um, for gap lengths or gap sizes, um, which is pretty cool. So we are going to model a Markov chain. We're gonna we're gonna practice dependency modeling. So here we're gonna demonstrate that. Our prediction of the next nucleotide is dependent on um, like K nucleotides. Um, we're going to, we're basically going to demonstrate a dependency in nucleotide sequence. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, and we're going to look at regions of chromosome eight using the human genome and try to discover differences between regions called CPG islands and the rest. So, um, we have 65,000 of these, I guess, CBG islands. And, um, and we're, we're looking at these diagrams. So um, we do a number of transformations. We have this IR um, CPG, which is um, like an I ranges object, I guess. And um, we are keeping these, uh, we're filtering it by chromosome eight. We're keeping these, the start and end um, columns. So IR, CPG, yeah, that's basically it. And I guess we have a width column as well, which um, uh, I think is randomly generated by the I ranges function, or I mean, I mean automatically I meant. Um, and we are going to visualize CBG locations. That's cool. That's cool. Um, and we are now viewing the CBG islands and the gaps. Uh, we save these into, we save these views into um, objects. So there we go. We have all the CBG islands. No. We have all the non-CBG islands. Um, they only contain coordinates. They're not the sequences themselves. So that saves on memory. We compute transition counts. Let's go. Let's compute these transition counts. Anyway, we have them over here already. These are all of the possible combinations of diagrams available in this sequence. Um, we, sorry. We have, there we go. Now we have the sums of all, excuse me. We have the sums of all of the possible transitions. Um, and we define a transition matrix. So this is like, there we go. We simplify it even more such that the row is the from and the column is the two nucleotide. And we compute frequencies. And then this is where I kind of, I left off. This is when uh, I saw Nina and she asked me where Leo is, but that's it. We have the frequencies. So that's cool. Um, and uh, that's that. That's, you know, that's Markov dependency modeling. Um, and then I think we have a little bit more, we have a little bit more, you know, juice left in this chapter, but not much. So we can say we finish. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say we finish this chapter. Let's go. We know statistics. Um, okay. Do we have any questions? Do we have any questions that I wanna that we would want on the stream? Do we have any questions that we would want to be recorded for uh, as long as the internet exists? Uh, okay. I'm gonna stop the. I'm gonna stop the recording. Um, how do I do that? What button do I press? Screen sharing, record, stop. You know what, I'm gonna pause recording.